Welcome to The Good Work Show, where we highlight the good that makes Atlanta work. Now, please welcome the hosts of The Good Work Show, Elaine Armstrong and Trinice Lyons. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first new edition of The Good Work Show. Yeah, we're, you can see us. <laughs> well, some of us, some of you can, if you're watching us on YouTube. Very exciting. I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm Elaine Armstrong and I'm Trinice Lyons. And we're the co hosts of The Good Work Show. So if you're new to the show and you haven't seen or heard us before, basically, this is a show that we created um, at Goodwill of North Georgia about three years ago. We wanted to really talk about our mission to put people to work. And we will do that on this show as you will hear us throughout you know, the months and years and weeks talk about what we do at Goodwill. And uh, we did that for the first couple of shows and ran out of steam. There was only so much that we could talk about, about Goodwill. We do a lot, but <laughs> we don't do an hour's worth of radio every week a lot. No. So, yeah. So we ran out of steam and we decided to use this show and use this format to help other nonprofits that are in Atlanta and serving Atlanta really talk about their mission and get the word out about what they're doing, good things in the community. So, you know, our tagline is where um, what? we highlight, well, the, we highlight good. the good that makes Atlanta work. I don't know why I was forgot what it was all of a sudden. But I, anyways, I'm glad I knew where you were going with that. Though. Yes. <laughs> so that's what we do on the Good Work Show. Uh, usually we start the show off really just kind of talking about really nothing um, on a lot of things all at the same time, but then kind of setting the stage for a couple of guests. And we've got some really good ones that are coming up after the break. So we are going to be talking to Kenneth Braswell, who is the CEO of Fathers Incorporated, um, a great organization that started out in New York. He started it out in his basement and was running it for um, a while until he moved to Atlanta. And now he's doing so much to help fathers, um, who are really not being supportive fathers, who maybe um, are men who maybe don't see their their children, don't have a relationship with their children, but to help them figure out how to do all of that um, and do it well, but then also um, navigate, you know, child um, support and getting a job and having transportation and so many things that really come along with um, being a good father and a good role model. So we're going to talk to him after the break and he's going to come in and chat with us for a little bit. Yeah, and then we're going to hear from the folks at Greenleaf Community Farms. We're going to talk about what they're doing in their community to actually. So in the email that we got, it said we're going to make America green again. So she said, mm. bear with this. We're going to we're going to talk about what that means. So they um, are bringing, you know, we've talked a lot. If folks have come over with us to our new home and um, heard some of the folks we've talked to recently, we've been talking about these community farms a lot mm-hmm. and um, the soil people. And the, and all of the stuff that folks are doing out there in the community to bring local farming here um, to Atlanta. So they're going to talk about what they're doing in that space. And um, so I'm looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. So about Goodwill. So the reason why we started this show was really to talk about our mission. And our mission at Goodwill is to put people to work. If you know about Goodwill, you probably know that you can shop there. We've got 62 opportunities for you to shop all across North Georgia. Is that we've how many? got we've got yes, yes. it is. Okay. That is correct. <laughs> you, you should know that number. I know um, I should. Uh, so then we have about 50 um, six or so some odd other places where you can make a donation and you can donate to Goodwill. Um, but then we have 13 career centers where a lot of people really don't know. And they're like, wait a minute, what do you mean by putting people to work? So we've got 13 locations across North Georgia where people can come in. You can come in as a shopper. If you're in the store, you can just walk right through another door that says career center. You can come in or if you are listening to the show or um, watching the show and know someone who needs a job or needs a better job or um, just as really to br- looking to brush up their skills about work or um, maybe, you know, word processing or um, any kind of skills or if they want to go into a new career. We've got so many programs that are available to them and all made possible by the fact that we have three million shoppers, three million donors, seven million shoppers every single year mm-hmm. who are supporting us. And um, through the sale of those goods, we are helping lots of people go to work every single year. So. We're going to talk about Goodwill on the show a lot, but um, but we won't bore you with only Goodwill stuff. We'll bring you stuff from other nonprofits. And whatever pops into our head that day. So bear <laughs> with us. Um, it, it, it'll it be a fun ride. If you haven't 
been here with us before. Mm-hmm. We're excited. We're excited to be here. We, um, you know, have new folks to talk to. So it should be a good time for everybody. Yep. So, yeah. That's all I've got. <laughs> That's all you have. That's all I have. I went on for like two You really minutes. did. So I, was I like, where's the... Where's the well, because you never stopped talking, so I just no, figured girl, you, you had to it add on. See what? Well, so, so the add on that I was thinking that she was gonna do was about how many people were gonna put to work. I left oh, the door you wide did. open, so I just thought you forgot. So no, I, I don't forget things like that. I mean, it will for thirteen years, everybody. I got this. <laughs> So we have a goal this year to put 25,000 people to work. And we are well on our way to do that. We have, um, we're almost there. So Mm -hmm. we operate on a fiscal year. So our fiscal year is actually coming to a close pretty soon. So we are almost there. We're really excited. And that's 25,000 people who have found a new job, who have found a better job, who have, who's been able to change the way that they live their lives just by nature of them coming into our career center, going through one of our training programs. Mm -hmm. And our training programs, I just think, is one of the coolest parts of what we do. So it's not just a matter of saying, okay, let's gonna, we're just going to go ahead and stick you in a job. We, Our folks in our career services actually goes out. They look at industries who that are really hiring in our community and create programs and allow people to get training in those particular industries. So mm-hmm. then that way, they're prepared for jobs that are available. And they're good jobs. And, you know, high. some of them are really high paying jobs and, you know, interesting fields. So it's really exciting the work that we're able to be a part of every day at Goodwill and the support that we get from our shoppers and our donors and our volunteers who come in. We have folks that come into our career centers Mm -hmm. and volunteer. All of that support is immeasurable to help us be able to do the work that we do. That's right. So if you're looking for um, a, a role in like IT, we've got a program for you. We've got a hospitality program. We've got um, a healthcare IT sort of um, hybrid program. If you want to learn how to drive a forklift or, um, you know, or get a CDL, we can help you do all of those things. We even have a partnership with Google uh, where we will help folks who really need to brush up their skills on using, like I said, word processing. Hey, if you've never did a spreadsheet before and you need to know how to do a budget, we can help you do that. So there's lots of opportunities to come in to Goodwill Services um, and to use what we have there. And then we also have careerconnector.org. And so we're going to be talking to, in a couple of shows, one of our colleagues who runs that program, and she can tell us all about it, you know, kind of how many people use it, but it's careerconnector.org. You can get to it from any device, mobile device, your computer, your tablet, you can't get it from a flip phone, but that's a whole nother story <laughs> if you still have one of those. But if you do, you can come into one of our career that's centers right. and use the computers there for free to be able to access careerconnector.org. Org. That's right. Yep. And so it's an extension of what we do in the career yes. centers on in an online space. And you can even chat with somebody who will coach you through finding a job. Yeah. And the great thing. So on top of all that kind of stuff. So say you're good. You're good. You're like, I don't need all of this, but maybe I just haven't gone on an interview mm-hmm. in 10 years because I've been working and I like my job, but I just want to try something different. We have stuff like that. So just being able to support you with trying to brush up on your interviewing skills. So, you know, we can give you as much or as little support as you need in order to get you to where you want to go. That's right. And then also coming up. So if you are like, well, Goodwill is my favorite place. I don't really need a job. I like to donate. But, um, you know, I want to go and shop. Well, we have opportunities for you you to do that. So I said 62. (laughs) Yes. But then we also are doing something super special with a couple of our stores this year. So before the summer is over, we will do a whole overhaul and refresh. And um, and we work on the marketing team at Goodwill, so we know all about this. But we are refreshing the look of some of our in-town stores. So you'll see a brand new brand and experience in some of our stores. And then we've got two that are brand new to us. So yes. we've got a store, South Harrison Road yes. in DeKalb County. And then we also have a South Buford store that is very near the biggest mall in Georgia. (laughs) The mall of Georgia is very near that. But uh, we have a store that will open there. And those two will open very soon, right? You've got opening dates. Yeah, I do. So, (laughs) yes, I do. In my head. Hold on. Okay. So one of them is June 13th. Yep. Is that a Thursday? It's it's a Thursday. And then June 27th. 
That's the other Thursday. Mm -hmm. So our stores open on Thursday. So just bear with me. So those are the two dates that um, we have coming. So South Harrison will open on the 13th and our South Beaufort location will open on the 27th. And anybody, so if anybody has gone to a Goodwill grand Mm -hmm. opening, you know, it's crazy, but it's the place that you want to be on that Thursday morning. There is going to be great product. There's going to be a lot of fanfare. Um, There's going to be a lot of people. It's kind of Walmart Black Friday kind of vibe going on so just be prepared (laughs) bring your chair you may have to sit out and wait a little bit but it's a great opportunity and then you can come meet us in person yes um i will not be at the south view (laughs) for opening however but i will no the south harrison i'll be at south buford so you'll meet one half of the good work show (laughs) better half anyway Yeah, no. So anyway, um, but I won't be, but come, please come. Please come. So you will, again, and the good thing about it is these new stores will also get the brand new yeah. look and feel. So there's some new things that if you have been a Goodwill shopper for years and years and years and years, you have your favorite Goodwill, keep it. We still want you to go there, but we are going to be rolling out a brand new look. They're going to get a facelift. I and mean, just, you know, every once in a while you need a little pick me up. And so these stores are going to get the nice branded look and we'll have some new features in the, some of those stores, yeah. too. So nice things, especially if you are a thrift shopper who likes to try things on. We think you're really going to enjoy our new dressing room set up in the new stores. Yeah. So come on out. We always say that there's going to be a good work show prize pack for the first person mm-hmm. that comes in and says they heard about it on the good work show. So we haven't given that prize pack away yet. <laughs> So it's still there. We knock the dust off it for every grand opening. So we hope somebody will claim it. We'll put something else new in it. That's what we should do. We should add add to it. Kind of like the Powerball. We just keep adding until somebody wins. But anyway, come by, say hi. Um, We look forward to seeing you. And thanks for joining us on the show. We're ready to get started. That's right. So coming up after the break, like I said, we're going to talk to Kenneth Braswell, who is from Fathers Incorporated. Really want you to tune in. And if you know a father who should tune in, go grab them, bring them back. We'll be back. You're listening to The Good Work Show. To learn more about the show and how your company can tell their story, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Good Work Show. Welcome back, everybody, to The Good Work Show. We are sitting here with our first guest of the day. It is Kenneth Braswell. He is the CEO of Fathers Incorporated. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. So um, so you're on one of our first shows for The Good Work Show in our new home. Um, yes, Yay! We're excited, All right. we're excited All right. to be here. We're excited you're here. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to know about Fathers Incorporated. So tell us all about the organization and your mission. So Fathers Incorporated began in 2004 um, in New York with an eye towards providing direct service, particularly for fathers, um, around child support, custody, and visitation. Um, At the time, I was going through my own personal situation, which usually drives people into social work, whatever Mm -hmm. your ill is, you want to do more for folks. And I realized doing community service that those three things weren't the issue. They were symptoms of the issue for the men that we were working with, that they were dealing with issues around employment, education, conflict resolution, communication, co-parenting, and quickly wanted to do something different than just be solely directed on those issues. And so what we began to do was look at professional development and capacity building of social work and human service agencies to help them better understand the nuances of working, particularly with men, but more in general fathers. Hmm. And so we shifted very quickly into that space. Um, In 2004, I became the director of the New York State Fatherhood Initiative, um, where we ran programs throughout the state of New York around workforce development, child support, parenting, softened, hard skills. Um, Left that position in 2010 applied for the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, won that contract in 2010, and we still have that contract today. And so we just were awarded the um, largest contract ever given to a not-for-profit to manage responsible fatherhood for the federal government at $19 million um, last October. And so that's our national base work. But here in Atlanta, we are... more of a direct service mechanism where we're really doing the case management of working particularly individual with individually with fathers to help them through their day-to-day issues as it relates to being better fathers and being better 
um, spouses and partners in their relationships. Uh-huh. That's great. So you talked about some big stuff that you guys are doing and a lot of responsibility. So even as we talk to organizations about the work that they're doing, we also like to give a little bit of a leadership nod <laughs> and let folks give a little bit of lead. How do you do this work? So you're the CEO of the organization. So mm-hmm. if you had to give people a little bit of advice on what do you have that makes you able to do this role, what would that be? You know, I started this work cranking along in my basement. <laughs> right, as most not for profits start in your own home. Mm. And so, for the first several years of Fathers Incorporated, that's where I operated out of the basement of my house. And one day I realized I had a business that it wasn't a hobby anymore, it wasn't just a social piece of work. Um, I realized that I had to hire people. I realized that I had to do 990s in taxes. I I had to talk to corporations and and talk to workers' compensation people. And Mm -hmm. this whole notion of like running a business. And so having a business before, I really at that point took on this mindset that although our core mission of Fathers Incorporated was to strengthen fathers, to um, strengthen families, that we were really in the business of people, Mm -hmm. right? Our commodity is fathers, like our asset is fathers. The development of our agency to um, build that asset to be a better resource for their children and families for us has become a business. Um, How do we look for return on investment with respect to the amount of resources that we're pouring into dads and the impact that they're having on their children and families? You know, how are we managing resources to create curriculum Mm -hmm. and to run programs and to manage $19 million contracts and to look for donors and sponsors for all of the work that we're doing? And so, you know, my staff just recently encouraged me to move from the moniker of executive director, right, that, you know, you are in the C-suite. You know, you are a chief executive officer of a business that is in the business of family, children, and well-being and community. And so I had to not only stop, I mean, continue to work like I'm in the business, but to identify myself as such. Hmm. So uh, tell us about some of the programs. So if a father comes to you, you say here in Atlanta is really more boots on the ground. You're you're actually working with the father. So mm-hmm. tell me what happens. Does a does a father come to you or are they court ordered? How does it work? And then what happens when they come to Fathers Incorporated from day one? You know, just kind of mm-hmm. walk us through the process. So, you know, the unfortunate reality as it relates to men and fathers is we really don't seek help until it's broken or it don't work. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so... <laughs> After you tried to fix it yourself, right. you just still didn't work. Right. And, didn't back. and you didn't read the instructions. <laughs> right. And so what happens is they don't typically just reach out to us until they're in that situation. Right. Until they have nowhere else to turn, no one else to talk to, and no more answers to fix their own issues. And so typically when they do come to us, they come to us in crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, child support has got them in in their wages and they're taking their driver's license and they're garnishing their wages and they're doing all of those kinds of things. Or they're in a situation with respect to the mother of their children and they can't reason with them and they can't talk to them and they can't see their child. And they're coming in in this with this level of desperation, like, I need mm-hmm. you to help me now and today. And as Fathers Incorporated, we always have to kind of, we, we have to listen to them, let them vent, let them get all of that out, and then push back and say, let's assess, because there are things that you need to fix your situation that you're not going to get today. Mm-hmm. I have to change your behavior. I have to change your habits. I have to change how you think about your situation. I have to connect you with resources that you don't even know you need and understand right now. Um, you're going to have to build trust in a relationship that may or not have any trust in it. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to walk into your children to reestablish relationships based on the age and how they feel about you being in their lives. All of this damage control that has been created over the past whatever amount of time has to be walked into. Some of the immediate emergency crisis, we can help you with. We might be able to get child support off your back, right? We might be able to get your license reinstated. We might be able to get your wages ungarnished. Um, Whether or not we're going to get her to like you today or not. (laughs) 
That's Listen. probably not going. We'll help you, but right. that's probably not going to happen. And so um, most of what we get comes that way. But then we also are activated in several spaces in Atlanta through barbershops, schools, and other not-for-profits who also refer men to us. And so they come oftentimes without being in such crisis. Mm -hmm. And so we can do fatherhood classes. We can do life skill classes. We can do financial literacy classes. We can do the things that strengthen them to become better men in the lives of their children and their fathers. So it's a myriad of ways that they Mm -hmm. do come into us and how they come into us. But primarily it's that crisis guy. Yeah. That comes into us, and 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 we have to kind of do next level work with him <laughs> in terms of dealing with his crisis at the moment, and then his long term goal. Yeah. Are they paired with somebody when they come in the door? Or do they come in and go right to classes and and such? No, we have an outreach team and an intake process. Okay, and then they're moved to our outreach team and our coordinator over the outreach team, and then we kind of determine from that point where, what they need. And so we try to address their immediate needs by referring them to the places and entities that they may need that immediate need. But at the same time, we kind of, as a carrot, you know, if you want this, then you should come to our fatherhood class. Got it. Because you're really not going to understand what you really want until you understand who you really are. Mm -hmm. That's great. So talk to us a little bit about some of the programs you have. I think we have a couple minutes left before we have to take a quick break, but you're talking about these classes and the programs and that kind of stuff. So give us a little taste of what, so after people have Mm -hmm. maybe gotten past that crisis point, Mm -hmm. or maybe they were, you know, that those few men that might be proactive that come in before (laughs) (laughs) the crisis point, what are the options for them? What are they walking into? And we can start and then maybe pick back up after the break. You know, I'll start with the classes because the, the classes are where we have our most intimate relationships with them, particularly our fatherhood classes and our life skill classes. So we have a great partnership with Atlanta Cares, who has a program called the University for Parents. Mm. And it's a consortium of not-for-profits that have come together to provide programming in one building. So you can have parents come into a building and they can get literacy classes and high school equivalency classes and nutrition, fatherhood, co-parenting, life skills. And the fatherhood class in particular for these guys that come into our building is a is an opportunity for them to become um, bonded with other men who are dealing with similar situations, um, to have a level of transparency, um, because a lot of times they're coming in with their story, but they're not telling the story. Mm-hmm. And so through transparency, we get the story. And so all of a sudden at the phone call, I get his story. But four weeks down the line, as he's sitting in his class, we start to hear, oh, you didn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Uh, when you call that, 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 yeah, that that, that changes things. Things. And so they become more comfortable in that space. And, you know, and that has become the most valuable piece of the work that we're doing because the deeper work with these guys are being able to kind of walk into their intimate and safe spaces to begin to find out what's really at the crux of what they're dealing with. And oftentimes that is an anger with the absence of a dad in their own lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So Kenneth, we want to talk a little bit more about some of the programs and then also maybe some things that you have coming up for the organization. Mm-hmm. So we're going to need to take a break. Um, but before we do, how do people get in contact with you? So we've got probably a couple seconds left before mm-hmm. we take the break can they go on a website mm-hmm. if, if there are you know fathers listening or maybe mm-hmm. their mothers listening and mm-hmm. watching and saying hey mm-hmm. i i know someone i need to refer them to the <laughs> they, need this they, they need me yes. right so, so the easiest way to get in touch with us obviously is our website at fathersincorporated.com okay um if you just simply go to google and type in either my name or fathers incorporated we come in up all over the place um, we have a Facebook fa- page that is fathersincorporated.com. Our Twitter handle is Fathers Incorporated, and we're on Instagram, LinkedIn, and all the other social media platforms. Y'all can contact someone. All right. Well, we are going to take a break. We'll be back with more of The Good Work Show. To learn more about the show and how your company can tell their story, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Good Work Show. 
Welcome back to the Good Work Show, everybody. We are sitting here with Kenneth Braswell, who is the CEO of Fathers Incorporated. Mm-hmm. We had a good discussion on the last segment, kind of learning about what you do, how you started in your basement. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and you you just mentioned during the break that you were running a $4 million organization out of your basement until it got to that point where you needed to hire people. That, right. that you could, didn't want them to see that you house, had pajamas right. on right. all day. <laughs> so, but, uh, but a great program to help uh, fathers re- Really become father. I mean, uh, you know, men become fathers mm-hmm. in a sense uh, mm-hmm. that you know they hadn't necessarily been doing what they needed to do to take care of their children and be in their children's lives. And mm-hmm. what you and your team are doing is to make sure that they have all of that, plus give them other services that will support them. Um, you know, jobs and workforce development and mm-hmm. and all of those um, those really important things that will help them along the way. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we were really just getting into some of the programs you had, and you talked about the fatherhood class. Is, and you also talked about some other services. What else are you doing um, as an organization to help really support these mm-hmm. men in, in being in their children's lives? So there's two other um, primary things that we've decided to do here in Atlanta to kind of address fatherhood engagement. One is in the literacy education space, where we started a program called Real Dads Read. Mm. It started out as a small program, and we wanted to just put books in barbershops to allow children and men to read in barbershops. And it very quickly turned into so much more than that. We started with a small grant from the Annie Casey Foundation to put 25 Mm -hmm. in barbershops in the MPVU in Atlanta and realized that resources in that particular area were scarce, Mm -hmm. even barbershops. And they gave us the ability to kind of expand throughout Metro Atlanta. As of yesterday, we just planted our 81st um, literacy center in Douglasville. And so we're in seven counties. We're in 73 barbershops. And we now have what we call Little Free Libraries Mm -hmm. because I'm now on the board, the national board of Little Free Library. And so we have 15 Little Free Libraries in front of low-income schools throughout the Atlanta public school system. And all of those um, libraries are there specifically to give us connection and relationship with the entity. And so as Fathers Incorporated and our primary mission to work with fathers, we have to be where fathers are. Mm -hmm. There are two places we know fathers are. In the barbershop at least two times, at least once every two weeks, and at school at some point. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not there, they're connected. And our MOUN relationship with the barbershops and with the schools is that if we bring in a literacy program to increase fatherhood engagement in the space of literacy, you have to give us access to your dads. Right. And so whenever we're running programs, whenever we're running any activities, those entities has have agreed with us to move that information to their constituency. So we have now a natural referral resource mechanism in Atlanta to which I don't have to go to every corner in the city to find dads. I know exactly where they are. And so the program itself is two generational in um, perspective with respect to on the dad side is increased fatherhood engagement and activity with your child. On the child side, it is we know that when fathers are actively engaged in the lives of their children, their children do so much better academically. Mm-hmm. They have better grades. They score more A's. They have higher self-esteem. They have more confidence in school, less deviant behaviors. All kinds of great things happen when dads are involved. On the literacy side, we know that um, our children struggle with third grade proficiency, particularly in low-income schools. Mm-hmm. And in low-income schools, of those children will never meet third grade proficiency standards, which means they're going to struggle economically in life. Mm -hmm. If we are smart people following the data, why aren't we looking at fathers as a solution to increase third grade proficiency in schools throughout our city? Mm -hmm. To me, as an agency, it sounds like a no-brainer. Right. And so the program itself is designed to get fathers more engaged so that we can increase the educational attainment of our children. So that's the education side. And now, so just real quick, so the library, so what kind of books are in the libraries? Glad I, you asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, our libraries are very unique. And okay. the books in our libraries are extremely unique. I have two, I walked into this with two very strict criteria for our books. One, Um, And this is because of where these libraries are in Mm -hmm. low-income communities. One, all of our books have to be brand new. Mm -hmm. Our children should know what it feels like to have a brand new book. Mm -hmm. Second-hand books are a 
uh, no is, um, what's the word I want to use? It is a um, deal breaker mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Our children, we've been giving our children secondhand books. You know, I remember growing up in school that every last one of my books had three names in it that was crossed out by the previous person who had it. And I don't want our children to see that. The second criteria is that all of our books are culturally relevant to the shop and entity that they're in. Hmm. And so if the shop is 99% African-American or 99% of those books in that case depict African-American children or African-American themes. And so where we're in other shops where we have more Latinas, we make sure that they're more Latino and Spanish speaking books. We're in the few shops we have. But there are more Caucasian children. We mix the children up. They become more diverse. Mm -hmm. And it is primarily not to narrow a focus of children that this is the only reality in life. It is to expose a reality that they're not exposed to, which is their own reality and how they show up in the world. And so we don't take donations out of people's basements and out of the back of their car and, you know, where they, you know, and those kinds of things. Financial donations are accepted because you know, <laughs> got to buy the could, book. Yeah, we can purchase our own books and right. put them in there. But that is those are what the books look like. And so, on average, there are fifty books in the library throughout the week. We retouch those entities every forty-five days. We okay. go back to them and replenish the books because the children can either take the books, never bring them back. They can mm-hmm. take them, read them, and bring them back, or they can read them and leave them. So mm-hmm. we turn over almost 850 books a month of children coming in and taking books and never bringing them back. So we have to have relationships with publishers and donors and Absolutely. resources that allow us to continue to replenish those books. Wow. Cool. So you've got um, something coming up uh, where there is an opportunity, you know, we've got Father's Day coming up, but you have an opportunity through your organization um, later on in the fall. So um, mm-hmm. so tell us a little bit about that. And is there is there a specific, you know, goal or um, or activity that happens around Father's Day where, mm-hmm. you know, is there a graduation or, you know, what, what happens uh, for your your clients when it becomes Father's Day? So for me, it's a day off. <laughs> because 364 days of the year is Father's Day for me. I'm uh-huh. always moving father. So on that day, it's like, don't call me. I'm not coming to speak at your church. I'm not doing any. Uh, I need to. See, that's a- when everybody wants you to come. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But I have to be a father. Yeah, and people right. forget that, mm-hmm. right? That I also have children. Mm-hmm. And I also have a wife that I have to keep happy. And so I can't like be off around the country being a father to everyone else mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not being a father to my own. And I can't accept the narrative that the shoemaker's children's shoes are worse than, right. you know, yeah. than everybody else's. Yeah. So my children have to have a level of father fullness from me in order for me to be comfortable trying to be a father to the rest of the world. Yeah. And so, but we just turned 15 years old this year. Wow, uh, wow. fantastic. Celebrated. And so I actually forgot about it because I'm working so hard. Somebody reminded me, mm. hey, you're 15 years old. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah, we are. Uh-huh. We got to do something. And so what we've decided to do was to do a 15th anniversary gala um, at Friendship Baptist Church on October 22nd. That happens to be my birthday. Ah, oh, nice. And you just threw yourself a party. Yeah, that's, that's, right, what, that's right. what this is all about. Absolutely. And so um, one of the things that the 15th anniversary brought up for me is this whole notion of the work that we're doing with fathers mm-hmm. and what are we dealing with today? So the theme of our dinner is under construction, reimagining the narrative of the modern dad, because our fathers today aren't the same as they were 40 years today Mm -hmm. or 40 years ago. And they're not going to be the same probably 10 years from now because everything is accelerated. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking traditional fatherhood, motherhood, parenting values, listen, I have a 10 year old. Um, son. All of them, I have five children, all girls. God gave me and my wife a surprise (laughs) blessing 10 years ago, right? Uh And it was a boy. And so, and I am learning with this 10-year-old, right? Because he is not even a millennial child. He's this next generation. Mm -hmm. He's this next level kid, hybrid of of millennials, that I cannot parent him the same way that I parented my girls. That's right. That his notion of my response to him is why, 
Mm-hmm. When my pre- I said why to my, you know what we got? Uh-huh. Why? Yeah. Like he needs explanation because he's logical in his thinking, mm-hmm. and he does, and he wants to make sense out of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So if I say you can't do this, his thing is why can't I do that? And I'm like. Well, not because I don't want to, you know. Yes. I, you know. As I said, <laughs> so. so is that, that going to work for him? Right. Yeah. So, so we're trying to create this narrative um, in October that forces us as a society to really look at the narrative of dads and how we show up in the world and make sure that we can adhere to all the responsibilities of being a father, but be very clear on the societal narrative and expectations that we have, not only for fathers, but for men in general, right? And so we can't push folks so far to the left, you know, that we want them to be the men in our houses, but not understand that there's a level of support that has to come with that and a moving of the traditional values that we have to embrace. And so, yes, my wife is all things to all people. She is my superwoman. Mm-hmm. She's the super mom. But at the same time, I am all things to men. I am the super dad. I'm Superman in my in my house. But have given both of those two things, I still have to pull her chair out. Mm-hmm. I still have to take out the garbage. I still have to close the door behind her. I still have to affirm her beauty. I still have to affirm those things in my girls. And so there's this real challenging struggle with fatherhood and the definition and narrative around masculinity that we have to somewhat try to embrace and identify so that our boys who are becoming dads 10 years from now, they can embrace it, society can embrace it, and we can't have over expectations of them. All right, October 22nd, so they can find that information on your website, yes. fathersincorporated.com. Com. Com. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Kenneth, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for stopping by the Good Work Show and, uh, and being one of our first guests. I That's know. Right. Yeah. That's going on my resume, too. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll be back with some more of the Good Work Show. To learn more about the show and how your company can tell their story, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Good Work Show. Welcome back to the show. We are sitting here with our next guest, and we have Krista. Tell me your last name, Krista. Leonard. Leonard, that's right. Uh, and you are with Greenleaf Community Farms. I am. Yes. So, um, so we love farms on the Good Work Show. We've, We've talked, talked to <laughs> talked to farmers. Who doesn't a lot. love farms? We really have. <laughs> um, well, we don't want to work on one, but let's just. But, but, <laughs> you would want to work on mine. I really? Promise. Okay. Yeah, so girl, we're, we're excited to dig in. So tell us all about Greenleaf Community Farms and your mission. Okay, so Greenleaf Community Farms was built um, through Greenleaf Property Management. So that is our corporate portion of our business. And the property team said, why um, why are we wasting money on building lawns or, mm. you know, taking care of lawns and landscaping? So they brought uh, the idea to bring in the development of agrihoods. And this is kind of a new niche, you know, Agrihood? Like agrihood. Agri-hood. So okay. Okay. it's building community around agriculture because food is the thing that we all have in common. Food is the thing that we all love. And it is much more of a conversation starter than a pool <laughs> and less expensive. Oh, I kind of <laughs> um, wish my HOA would go in that direction. Yeah. You know, they actually <laughs> they have a lot of agrihoods that are developed in that way. Um, the thing about us is that Greenleaf then created Greenleaf Foundation, and we are part of the foundation now. So we develop the agrihoods, and not only do we farm it, but we create programming and education for youth as well as farmers in the southeast. So um, we're in the beginning stages, and currently we have three of those farms. Um, And so it's been an interesting uh, progression. So talk to us a little bit about how the farms kind of bring people like what is the impact that happens in the communities when you have these farms? Um, Well, okay. so the way that it works is it's essentially I don't community supported agriculture. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, It's essentially where the community makes it possible to have a farm. So our whole philosophy at Greenleaf, not only at the farms, but at the property management, is that we are very focused on the social well-being of our residents. Um, so we are not really amenities like gym and pool focused. We're more like how do we make the lives of our residents better and easier? Because we're dealing with not only, you know, millennial population, uh, hospitality workers, students, uh, immigrant families, families of all kinds. And we have so many different types of properties. 
So when you think about it, when you're coming out into an outdoor situation, if say that we, uh, I'll give you an example. A 50 year old man came to me and said, um, I would have never met Rebecca, who is 22, if we would have had a pool. Because it would have been weird for me to talk to her or her to talk to me because we're in our bathing suits and all of this. But when you have a farm situation, everybody's working, everybody's on level playing ground, and everybody likes to eat. So when we deliver that food to people, they get very excited about it. They start to see the farm. And we have chickens. We've got hammocks. You know, we create an environment that is inviting. Hmm. So so let me just be so clear. So is it like apartment-style living Yes. So, so you don't have any tennis courts or like not the laundry some room. Of our, some of our you apartments just, you have, have the pools, farm. but um, yeah. three of our apartments currently have um, farms. So yeah. we have two farms that are a half an acre. And then our newest one on the west side on Joseph E. Boone is about two acres. And so that's a huge one. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. So that, that's cool. So, that's so cool. painting the painting the picture. So you, you've got a a program called Farm in a Box. So <laughs> yeah. so tell us all about Farm in a Box and, and how does that differ from what you're doing at the, the communities? When I came on um, and Greenleaf Management being a property company, each of the properties is run on its own budget. So I kind of wanted to decide, like, how do we standardize a system of creation for mm-hmm. how much is going to cost properties to build farms on the property? Mm-hmm. So it's a very hard thing to standardize because farming is very back and forth. You don't know what you need. There's a lot of, you know, stuff that happens and breaks. And so this is still a work in progress. But what it essentially is, is like if I were going to give you a pamphlet or you mm-hmm. were buying a car, right? you get a standard car. So what does a farm need to run? You know, it needs soil, it needs water, it needs seeds, it needs all of these things. And then you can add different things like the sunroof or you've got leather seats. Mm-hmm. And for us, it's like, oh, you can add a chicken coop or you can have picnic tables or barbecue grills. And that helps the property team say, yes, we can afford this. Mm. This is something that we want to put in for our residents. And then this is how much it's going to cost us to build and maintain. Nice. Okay, cool. So it that was just sense. a standardized system. Can anybody buy the farm in a box? <laughs> no, that's so just, only that is like my thinking. Like I was just thinking like, okay, like a happy well, I mean, meal a is always idea. the same. Like, you open. But anybody could essentially do it, right? Yeah. Like any property company could do do that could a residential like say i wanted a farm at my house <laughs> could i say um, could i call and say hey krista i want a farm in a box yeah we're friends house. now you could definitely do that <laughs> <laughs> and wait, it's got the space. To order a person to work the farm <laughs> but i'm just saying like i could get the farm at yeah <laughs> i mean i we actually you or know schools even i think you know that yeah, would be a, yeah a market for there schools. are a lot of people that are doing stuff on on, on the school side and mm-hmm. you know urban sprouts farms that's right and, um, mm-hmm. You know, you've got Food Well Alliance, you've got George Organics, all of these people are doing that. And so in my mind, I was just thinking on the level of like, if I have to sell this to a property manager, which they are tough cookies. Yeah. yeah. I have to come up with a very systematic approach to doing That's it. That's very smart. I need to figure, I'm serious. I need to figure out a way to get my HOA to get close the pool and put in a <laughs> well, farm. Well, tell them, Nicole, Krista, you got, <laughs> how many people use your pool? A lot. Uh, okay. it. But I'm just trying to figure out, like, how can I reduce my HOA fees? <laughs> Take the tennis court out. Now, the tennis court, absolutely. Because last night, it was like 10 o'clock at night, and people were playing tennis. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Oh. So, so yeah, farms are go. quiet. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I guess maybe not, not the chickens. Have chickens. <laughs> my chickens are very talkative, but I love them. <laughs> I have baby ones right by my on my porch. So oh, Nice. Kind of cool. Um, Farm crazy, I don't know. <laughs> so tell us a little bit. So you said you had other programs. So what else is going on within the farms mm-hmm. or within the communities? And just what does it look like? Do you share the food? Like what happens? So how does that whole process work? Okay, so it's really cool because we live in the day and age of text messaging services. I send you a text. Um, I say, I'm going to harvest. We typically harvest every Wednesday. Um, if you would like, please reply yes. Place your bag on your door. And then I have a number of how many want food. I pack, I harvest, or the residents and I harvest, and then we fill the bags and and return them. We also have a composting service that we give them a free composting bucket. We weigh everything that comes out of the farm and everything Mm. that comes back in. We want to have kind of a circular effect about what we're doing. So 2,500 pounds out, hopefully 2,500 pounds back in. Mm -hmm. Um, And then our residents actually are the farm staff. 
So I have six liaisons at one farm um, currently, and the liaisons get a rental credit for oh, like a concession cool. for working five hours a week on the farm. So um, you're taking people who necessarily don't have any experience or they have little bits of experience um, and you're teaching them about agriculture and that hyper local um, agri hood is kind of that trickle down effect because everybody ends up kind of sharing food. Right. And so there's no stinginess with the food. Like we are very adamant that we harvest it just so it gets maintained very well. Mm -hmm. But um, if somebody were to call me and said, hey, I need a bunch of kale, I'm not going to be like, no, you can't have kale because it's not Wednesday. You know, Mm -hmm. so it's just it's very um, this is theirs and they built it. Okay, so is it like I don't know, I, I, is it Chicken Little, the one where you had, like, he didn't want to put in and do the, any of the work, so he didn't get any of the bread nope. at the end? everybody, what, what everybody so, gets food. I don't know if that's the right story, but it was it Chicken Little, or was that the one where that the sky was sky the fall. Well, there's the another fall. one where, you know what I'm yeah, talking about. Is no. it the little red hen you or don't, something? something? Anyway, there's a story well, about you the little bird. Heads. <laughs> and, you know, it, was, it was the little bird that didn't want to help with the with the yeah. stuff, and he didn't get any of the food, so it's no. not like that, so it's no, not mandatory. No, it's not like that at all. Okay. Um, not everybody has the time right right? I mean if you are working two or three jobs just to make ends meet um, which is a lot of our population and you have kids or you've got stuff going on um, there is no there's no requirement for you but we do provide opportunities for them to be involved by um, the third Saturdays of every month we do a learn and grow where we Hmm. not only invite all of the residents but the community as well Mm -hmm. and they can come out to the farm and enjoy a day and have lunch on the farm and just get your hands dirty, and it's very chill, and it's, I mean, it's a really good environment to be in, especially when you have kids, I think. How do you fund it? So, how do, how do, um, so currently, uh, my, the company, Greenleaf Management, funds all of this, so oh. we set a budget, and um, our focus is not bringing money in, it's bringing in retention. Mm. And so that goes with even the property side of things. Uh, so we want to make our residents happy so they stay because every time they renew their lease, yeah. it saves us $4,000. Yeah. So mm-hmm. think about that on a level of 100 apartments. If they love the garden and they're like, I don't want to move from here. I have such connection. It's saving us a lot of money, therefore paying for it in retention. Got it. It's Got the it. social capital side of things versus the commerce. Yeah. But you could make a donor. So if you, if somebody were listening and they're like, this is yeah. great. I want to yeah. invest. You can go to our website. Agri-hood. It's um, greenleafcommunityfarms.org. Um, all of the donations and things that we get actually go back into the community with programming and, um, you know, providing education for, we work with Camp Luke to get their kids out. Um, so we are community driven in that sense and it, and it does go back into people. So it's not funding our property company, it's right. funding an initiative that's very focused on the social happiness and well-being. Got it. Cool. Um, cool. So what's in the, like, what are you guys growing? Right now we are in that transfer from spring crops to summer. Mm-hmm. So it's cucumbers, squash, zucchini, or watermelon, which makes me really happy. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we, I mean, we've grown over 700 pounds of food in wow. three wow. months. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So can pe- are people like clamoring to move in now? Um, people <laughs> see it and they're like, oh my gosh, this is why we moved in. This is so uh-huh. amazing. And they're so, you know, now that it's there and we've renovated some of the apartments on the other side and they're finally open. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting that we get a lot of people referring just because of the garden. Wow. So. Well, Krista, thanks for stopping by the Thank show you. today. It's been a great show. Um, we're so glad you tuned in with us today. Um, so, Greenleaf, we wish you all the best. And I know, like, for yeah, this, like, here follow us a lot on, of people. Um, follow yeah. us on social media. Um, that's where we do a lot of our just promotions of stuff that we have going on. And just- Um, on our website as well. All right. And we thank uh, Kenneth for stopping by a little earlier for Fathers Incorporated. That is our show today. Um, We're so glad you joined us. Absolutely. (laughs) For our first show. Our first show. So thank you so much. And we'll be back next week. Bye. Bye.